Welcome everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Maya Tolstoy. I'm the Interim Executive Vice President of Arts and Sciences and the Dean of the Faculty uh, here at Columbia. I am delighted to welcome you to the annual Queen Wilhelmina Lecture. Our speaker this year is the Mayor of Amsterdam, uh, Vimke Halsema. It is our great privilege and honor to welcome her to Columbia today. Uh, Femke Halsema became the mayor of Amsterdam a little bit uh, over a year, less than a year ago. She's the first woman to hold the position. Um, she's had an extremely rich career in which she's been involved in politics as well as journalism, theater, and film. Uh, she's also published numerous books and she has taught at the University of Tilburg and Utrecht. Uh, Mayor Halsema was a member of the Dutch Parliament from 1998 to 2011. She served as the leader of the Green Party and was the spokesperson for the Party of Justice, International Affairs, uh, health, Healthcare and Media and Culture. She was also a member of the Intelligence and Security Forces Parliamentary Committee. After 12 years in national politics, uh, Mayor Helsma went back to writing and culture. She concluded research and, and directed a documentary series for Dutch television about women in the Islamic world and another series on international terrorism. She co-founded a digital platform for investigative journalism, co-produced and wrote a political drama series, as well as a theater lecture on national Dutch identity. <laughs> More recently, uh, Mayor Halsma wrote an essay, Power and an imagination in which she describes the dominance of technocracy in, at the expense of idealism. She argued in favor of imagination and hope as powerful forces in our society. And I think that's a particularly wonderful message here at, here at Columbia where imagination is so important as is hope <laughs> for other reasons. Um, from, from, <laughs> from today's event, uh, Mayor Halsema suggested a conversation on imagined urban communities, in which she proposes to continue to explore the questions developed in power and imagination. She will give us her perspective as the mayor of an open and diverse city, and will present her views about how to address the current challenges facing our cities. Mayor Helsma, welcome and thank you for being with us today. So to guide us in this conversation about imagined urban communities, we are very fortunate to have with us Professor Saskia Sassen, who just flew in this morning and is flying out again tomorrow. So thank you for making the time. She's made time in her incredibly busy, incredibly busy schedule. Um, so she's among today's most innovative thinkers about cities and about the dynamics which are shaping the future of the world. Uh, Saskia Sassen is the Robert Lynn Professor of Sociology at Columbia University. She works works on globalization, immigration, network technologies, and their impact. She's author of numerous books, including The Global City and Territory Authority Rights from Medieval to Global Assemblages. I could not imagine a better conversational partner than Saskia for this discussion, and we are very grateful that she is joining us here today. Um, Ido Dahan, is, who is Professor of Political History at Utrecht University, um, will moderate the discussion and the question and answer session with the, with the audience. Uh, Professor Dahan is at Columbia this spring semester as the Queen Wilhelmina Visiting Professor of History, Language and Literature of the Dutch-speaking people. As such, he is, one, he is the one who proposed us to invite Mayor Halsema to speak at Columbia this year. I would like to thank Ido for initiating this project, for organizing the, this Queen Wilhelmina lecture in coordination with the co-chairs of the studies of the Dutch-speaking world, Martha Howell and Pamela Smith. Um, with the support of the European Institute and of Columbia World Projects. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome members of our audience who are accompanying Maya Halsema during her visit to New York this week, in particular, Mayor Jos Wienen, the mayor of Harlem, 
Welcome. Um, Ambassador Dolph uh, Hochevening, the Consul General of the Netherlands in New York. Welcome. Um, and I don't think, I'm not sure she's joined us yet, but Avianca Aventuren, the youth mayor of Amsterdam, who, who will be here soon. Um, and the representatives of the City Collective Amsterdam, a group of innovators, artists, and entrepreneurs who are joining forces with Femke Helsema on her trade mission to New York. So thank you also for being here. Um, I've been told that for her week in New York, Mayor Halsema has established an informal headquarters aboard the Clipper City of Amsterdam at Chelsea Piers. I'm delighted to hear that, having myself led numerous research expeditions at sea in my work as a marine geophysicist. I sometimes miss that excitement and energy of, of being at sea, and so I, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from, from uh, Mayor Halsema tonight to share with us uh, some of her thoughts on the global cities and some of this excitement excitement and energy uh, that she brings as well. So it's my great pleasure to uh, now give the floor to Mayor Halsema. Uh, but before that, please join me in welcoming her again. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for having me. It's a great honor for me, but I need my glasses, for me to address you here today. This is, of course, the oldest university of the state of New York which makes Columbia University a central part of your city's story over the century. And it's the stories of cities that I want to focus on today. In 1983, the anthropologist and political scientist Benedict Anderson published Imagined Communities. It has become an iconic work about the rise about the rise of nationalism in the 19th century and the meaning of nationalism today. In this work Anderson makes two interesting and important points. First of all, he says that national identity is a product of imagination. Not in the sense that it is imaginary or unreal, but in the sense that it is constructed from collectively preserved memories, stories that are told again and again, culturally, culturally significant symbols and new tradi traditions. National identity, he says, is not fixed. It is fluid and subject to change. We can influence and shape it. Our national self-image, for instance, is partly defined by what we decide to commemorate and what we decide to forget. Secondly, he says, contrary to popular belief, nationalism is not necessarily a conservative phenomenon. To think that, says Anderson, is a costly mistake. I quote, in an age where it's so common for progressive cosmopolitan intellectuals to insist on the near pathological character of nationalism, its roots in fear and hate of the other, and its affinities with racism, it is useful to remind ourselves that nations inspire love and often profoundly self-sacrificing um, love of the other." End of quote. I agree with him that nationalism can certainly be com combined with progressive values, such as openness, tolerance, or cosmopolitanism. The capacity to welcome strangers can actually be an important part of a national identity, as it has long been here in the United States and in Holland. Well, this afternoon I would like to shift the perspective from the nation state to the imagined community of the city. Or should I say from nationalism to localism? the meaning of a strong and shared local identity for the city and its Im inhabitants. Is there a local identity and can it, like on a national scale, help create a community, inspire its citizens and provide them at the same time with a sense of belonging? 
This is, I think, an urgent question, because many citizens feel displaced and unwelcome. As we all know today, the nation states, especially in Europe at the moment, struggle to inspire a sense of loyalty and belonging in its residents. The city seems to be doing a better job in that department. Amsterdamers, for instance, feel more attached to Amsterdam than Dutch people do to the Netherlands, as research very recently showed. And I think it's the same with New York. An identity survey among young Amsterdamers from Dutch, Moroccan, Turkish, and Surinamese descent um, uh, showed that they feel more Amsterdamer than they do feel Dutch. Many, in fact, do not necessarily feel at home in the Netherlands, but instinctively see themselves as Amsterdamers. And they are proud of their city. I am an Amsterdamer, or it's like I am a New Yorker, are words that resonate with significance. Yet their exact meaning is also often elusive and prone to marketing claims like cosmopolitan, vibrant, and a cultural hotspot. It is the language often used by tourist, uh, tourist agencies uh, to praise cities around the world, not only Amsterdam or, and New York, but also Madrid or Beijing. The local identity is usually only seen as derived from and subordinate to the national identity. But I am convinced that if we want to give young people, and especially bicultural youth, who in Amsterdam form the majority of young people growing up, if we want to give them self-confidence and direction for the future, we are wise to strengthen the identity of cities, of the city we live in and the city they live in, and give it more depth than we hear daily in marketing terms or in marketing slogans. As far as I'm concerned, this means that we must systematically examine and re-evaluate re local identity, its historical development, emotional significance, and contrib contribution to dem democratic citizenship. We have to look for a modern local identity that includes and projects very diff uh, and protects sorry that includes and protects very different people so that they can feel at home in our city. Is it Amsterdam or New York? And I would like to examine the three key elements that um, form every identity, be it a national or a local identity. And I want to start with the key element of history. As in our city, in Amsterdam, we are, as in New York, standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, the people who built and populated our cities in the centuries before us. Some political philosophers uh, hold that a viable society can only exist if all its members share the same interpretation of history and the same values that rise from it, that come from it. But both in the Netherlands and in the United States of America, we are con continuously reassessing our identity. History books in hand. In this ongoing debate, Pride and shame battle for supremacy. Was the 7th century, the 17th century in Holland really a golden age? A century of mercantile endeavor, curiosity and tolerance? Or was it a century of slavery, colonialism and greed? And how should we feel personally towards our past? My home in Amsterdam the official mayor's um, uh, residence is a magnificent 17th century building situated on one of the famous canals in our city center. And it was built, as you probably would have guessed, by a slave trader. And this university 
has a similar story to tell. Some of its founders, including Henry Beekman, was originally from Holland, uh, were slave owners. Yet it is equally true that academics of this university have over the years garnered no less than 72 Nobel Prizes. Let me give you another example of our ambivalent past. In 1946, Queen Wilhelmina, um, the name uh, giver of this speech, honored Amsterdam with the motto, heroic, steadfast, compassionate. To commemorate um, the February strike of workers and civil servants in 1941 in Amsterdam. The strike was held in protest against the persecution of Jews. And this motto was added to the city's coat of arms and now forms an inseparable um, part of our symbolic identity. But were all Amsterdammers brave enough to resist the Nazis during the Second World War? You probably know the Amsterdammers were not. Um, many looked away or actively collaborated with the de deportation of tens of thousands of their Jewish neighbors. Clearly, the city history provides important ingredients for building a shared history. But our history also causes pain. And this means our interpretation of the past needs to be constantly reviewed as we absorb new citizens from different and often, and often distant regions with a painful memory of our not always so glorious past. And their histories must be added to the mix. Only then can they be part of the local identity that comes from our history. Second, as a key element, cities are built on, emo on emotions. As Alicia Keys and Jay-Z sing <laughs> of the concrete, yeah, it's quite a, a difference with a... As Alicia Keys and Jay-Z sing of the concrete jungle where dreams are made of, or as the Dutch band, De Dijk, sings, Deze stad is een veel te mooie vrouw. This city is too beautiful a woman. We all know that feeling as you return from holiday or a far-flung trip and you drive into the lit-up city or roll into the city, into the station, and find yourself in the midst of an anonymous crowd. Nobody knows you. Nobody has missed you. But you have missed them. In a funny sort of way. The city with its specific smell, the smell of water in Amsterdam, its familiar sounds, the unique reflection of the sun in the, in the Hudson, or the Amstel in Amsterdam. That sense of pride when the New York Yankees beat the Boston Red Sox. Or our soccer team in Amsterdam, Ajax, hammers Real Madrid, Real Madrid. Or I hope tomorrow night, uh, Juventus. It's a very important game, if I may add. Some feel it more than others, but we all feel it to a certain extent. It's elusive and irrational. It rises up and subsides again, but it is always lingering beneath the surface. It's the love, pride, and sense of belonging you feel for your city. It is not something you can put your finger on, and it's very personal. No doubt some of you here cannot stand Alicia Keys or the dyke. Although that's not really possible. <laughs> or some of you maybe hate the smell of the Hudson or the Amstel. That is why emotion is such an important ingredient in our civic identity. It's a crucial and personal spark that ignites our personal allegiance to our city. Third, 
our oral as well as our formal history. The stories we tell each other and the emotions we share are the basis for local citizenship, for active participation in the local community. But it is not enough. Cities are, are part of the nation state and not independent entities. Until the 18th century, Amsterdam had a privileged class in Dutch porters alongside the ordinary residents. This privileged status was obtained through birth, marriage, or by paying a sum of money. In exchange, you could become a mem member of a guild, hold administrative po posts, and were exempt for paying toll. So this form of civic citizenship existed long before national citizenship was introduced in the 18th century. In 1653, the Dutch West Indies Company, which was responsible for the Dutch settlement on the island, the Isle of Manahatta, awarded citizen, um, city rights to New Amsterdam. This meant that mayors and aldermen were appointed to represent the people. A few years later, civic citizenship rights were introduced based on the Dutch model, with rights and obligations. For a few years, life went its peaceful and democratic way in New Amsterdam. But then the English arrived, and the rest is history. <laughs> Last year, Martin Prak, a Dutch historian, published a book entitled Citizens Without Nations. According to him, local forms of citizenships used to exist all over the world, but were ab abandoned after the French Revolution um, in favor of a national version of citizenship based on greater equality. In his book, Prak convincingly demonstrates that the local institutions, like social services, guilds, and civic militias, resulted in a high level of public participation, acceptance, and trust. He claims that Europe actually became less democratic when local civic citizenship made way for national civ uh, uh, citizenship. And in his view, we need to revisit and reappreciate the role that local citizenship can play alongside national citizenship. And do not get me wrong. I would not want to replace, now I'm a mayor, state citizenship with city citizenship. But I would like to shape the latter more actively and more conscious, consciously of the meaning it has in people's lives. Not only do I think it is necessary for the future of, of young people growing up in Amsterdam and in New York, but it is also the only way to tackle a number of developments that threaten cities in general and Amsterdam and I think also New York in particular. Let me list these threatening developments, or maybe I should say challenges. First, the growing economy in our cities is not only benefiting residents and respectable business. Soaring real estate prices encourage speculation and money laundering. The real estate market is not very transparent, and criminals can easily buy properties through shell companies to stay out of sight and avoid normal permit procedures. On this subject, the Dutch-American sociologist Saskia Sessen, and I really am very honored that you are here, has written about a certain type of money and the way it can influence and change our cities. It is not necessary illegal money. She calls it high finance. It's a way of earning money that extracts value from society and creates a material and moral vacuum. Parallel criminal economies are not a local phenomena. These organizations and systems have ramifications across the entire world. From the coca producers in Latin America via Los Angeles, Antwerp to Amsterdam, 
from the Cayman Isles via Moscow to Switzerland. But the corrosive and undermining effects are visible at a local level. We see them, for instance, in the real estate market when new property sales or developments are forced through purely, uh, are forced through purely for commercial interests. Or when lots of shops in our inner cities of the same kind suddenly appear. Or when there is an increase in the number of contract killings in the criminal world. The illegal economy displaces and threatens the legal economy and erodes the sense of security and well-being of citizens and business owners. People see office buildings standing empty as investment properties and shady shops and restaurants that obviously do not make enough money by legal means to pay the rent. This makes people uneasy. Criminal activities like these undermine our cities, both financially and morally. Second, another worrying development that poses a threat to our identity are polarization and radicalization. The threat level of um, uh, um, terror attacks has remained substantially unchanged for several years now. And the risk of a terrorist attack in our city is very real. And the biggest threat continue to come from jihadist groups. Last year, an um, IS, I, I think you, you'd call it differently, um, um, ISIS, I'm sorry. ISIS-inspired uh, German national stabbed two American citizens in Amsterdam Central Station. But I should add that more recently, our security services have also detected a growing threat from extreme right-wing circles. Radicalization, as we see it, is the process by which people embrace the desire to impose their views through undemocratic and possibly violent means on society. Clearly, our primary concern is the possibility of a violent attack. But even without this extreme outcome, radicalization with its, with its associated lack of tolerance and rejection of our society is extremely worrying. Particularly as it is usually invisible. It's happening in the hearts and minds of our residents in back rooms and on the internet, and recently in Amsterdam at a secondary school. Clearly, the invisibility does not make the threat any less serious. Urban society works as long as we share certain basic democratic principles with each other. At one end of the spectrum, we must be careful not to intervene in people's personal lives even if their opinions and behavior repel us. But at the other end, we must remove anything that facilitates radicalization and prevent residents from turning their backs on our local society. Third, in 2025, Amsterdam expects to welcome 29 million visitors with a population of, at that time, one million um, uh, residents. The majority will visit the oldest part of our city, the red light district. These people, these to tourists, are not necessarily interested in our culture and history, but tend to come in group and are attracted to the cannabis cafes and window prostitution. prostitution. Most, um, uh, incidentally, just gaze or gape at the ladies. But the people who live in the area suffer from the inunda inundation of tourists. Another effect is that the city center is becoming a place for tourists only. The post offices, the library, have already gone. Unique shops 
have shut their doors and made way for Nutella bars. You know Nutella bars? Are they a problem in New York also? <laughs> well. And ice cream parlors. The social fabric is crumbling and only fast food, souvenirs and low entertainment are left. That is eroding the morale of the people living in the center. And other Amsterdammers too are shunning the city center, which they once regarded as their extended living room. Fourth. In his book, Vanishing New York, Jeremiah Moss lamented the process of gentrification in New York. He sternly warns us and himself as lovers of art galleries, psychopaths, and trendy coffee bars that sometimes a latte, a latte, is not just a latte. Gentrification, of course, is also a well-known, uh, well-known phenomenon in Amsterdam. Neighborhoods that are transformed from grim slums into lively hub of arts and culture with a mixture of old and new residents, combined with initially reasonable house prices, initially. <laughs> This vibrant mix acts as a mix as a magnet on young fashi- on young families, professionals, experts, and of course real estate investors. As Moss observed somewhat dramatically, a middle-class white person in a low-income neighborhood, especially in a neighborhood of color, is like a drop of blood in a pool surrounded by circling sharks. The sharks, of course, are the speculators. And so dream and nightmare emerge, uniformity is the end product. Meanwhile, there are neighborhoods on the periphery of the city that nobody seems to notice. Neighborhoods where poverty, crime, school dropouts and domestic violence make such a toxic cocktail that gentrification is unlikely to ever get a foot in the door. And these are also the neighborhoods where young people grow up feeling estranged and unwelcome. If the city no longer belonged to many diverse kinds of people, but to a small number of individuals who do not live there, but exploit it as their cash cow, then something essentially essential has gone missing. And if extremism is allowed to prevail and differences of opinion are no longer accepted, then again, something essential has gone missing. When these phenomena occur, a city like Amsterdam protests. People openly express discontent, turn their backs on the public space, or even worse, leave the city altogether. What are we going to do? And I think the answer is found in preserving, mobilizing, creating, and recreating a shared local identity, in actively helping establishing a local, imagined and not imagined community that is inclusive and brings hope to its citizens. So what can we do to protect and preserve a local imagined community and mobilize it with its key elements also of shared history shared emotions and shared citizenship and mobilize it as a force of good. Finally, I see six, but they're not as long, six takeaways. First, create a safe and secure urban environment. If we fail to ensure that everyone feels equally safe and secure, and we should acknowledge that safety is a scarcity and it's not distributed equally among its citizens. We cannot expect all our citizens to contribute when they're not safe to a strong civic democracy with a shared identity. 
a city to a city that is strong and resilient. Two, protect the public space and create more public space. The city belongs to everyone. Our neighborhoods, squares and streets are public spaces that we must protect so that all citizens are assured of a safe and peaceful life. It is their space. Third, admit and enforce fluidity. Civic identity brings together a great many contrasts. It is subjective and objective. The present and the past, individual and collective, emotional and rational. The fact that it is fluid and ab ambiguous, that it is an emotional, fluid and ambiguous concept, does not, however, mean that it is empty. It's just the opposite. Four, delve into the history to tell new stories of the past. Not a single story of a single strong leader, but a great variety of stories to reflect the diversity and autonomy of all Amsterdamers and all New Yorkers. Within that diversity, we can choose to highlight a recurrent theme to serve as a guiding beacon. As Rebecca Solnitz writes in her beautiful little book, Hope in the Dark, the past offers us perspectives for a future of hope. You must know the major changes that a community has gone through in the past to embrace the possibi possibility of renewal, change, and Im improvement in the future. Hope accommodates both pride and shame, and simultaneously creates forward-directed energy. Civic identity, in short, is not just based on the memory of many, but also on the imagination of many. Five, increase political involvement. That imagined future of the citizens centers on the changes they are looking and hoping for. As noted, their close involvement with the city and each other is not reflected now in strong political involvement. And it is up to local politicians and their mayor to change this. The turnout of local election would be much bigger if residents knew their voice was really heard. At all time, and not just during and for and just after the elections. Perhaps we should even have the ambition, as Martin Prax suggests, to rethink our understanding of civic citizenship and give it a more formal status in law. Six. Finally, acknowledge who is at the center of everything. The identity of the city is visible in buildings and symbols. Dumb Square in Amsterdam, Central Park in New York, the Canal Belts, the Statue of Liberty. But without people, it is all meaningless. Our civic identity is carried within the Amsterdamers and New Yorkers. They help to solve the problems I have described by showing through their words and actions what it means to be an Amsterdamer and to be a New Yorker. Respectable shopkeepers and public-spirited real estate developers, young people in vulnerable neighborhoods who act as inspiring role models for their peers and show that crime is not the only option, that you can have self-esteem and pride without rejecting, rejecting society. Women and girls who break out of the traditional mold and embrace freedom. They too deserve, deserve to be put into the spotlights. And the, re and the residents who resist gentrification and tourism in their neighborhoods and try to maintain co cohesion in the city by being good neighbors for each other 
they all deserve our support because they are the living embodiment of what it means to be an Amsterdammer, to be a New Yorker. Thank you very much. So Saskia will kick off uh, the, the, the conversation. Uh, we will talk uh, among the three of us for a while, and then there's opportunity for, to ask questions. But Saskia, and, and may I just say that my young uh, colleague has just arrived. She's the young mayor of Amsterdam, Avianca. Avianca. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, you're here. There is a seat for you there. So please, or here. Yes, please. <laughs> Saskia. Uh, well, uh, this was an extraordinary talk. I will not say that I have sat in many uh, situations where a mayor got to give a talk, uh, but this was truly extraordinary. And, and the way you went digging in, and the way you exposed, I also much appreciated that uh, you didn't only sing the praises of a city. Amsterdam is an amazing city, but also the threats. Yeah. And so one, one of the subjects that for me has become so important is the way in which very advanced, complex, and on their own terms, admirable uh, financial instruments are actually really altering in an invisible way very often what is happening in cities. So we now have a situation where a very significant number of major firms are Buying up is not quite the term, it's financializing, which means a form of acquisition that is not simply about property. It is something else. And, and this is what I've now been, been working on. And, um, and, and I mean, it's not easy to explain, so I apologize, I want to communicate. But one way of putting it is that when you're dealing with high finance, you're dealing with algorithmic mathematics. This has nothing to do with economics. Algorithmic mathematics allows you to transform all kinds of conditions, including buildings. We see the buildings, but what is really happening is that the building begins to function as an asset. And out of that asset, you generate an asset-backed security, which can then float around. So two, there are two trends. One is this, which is fairly fanciful, fairly complex, but it's happening all over the place. And it is also happening in, in Amsterdam and in a whole variety of other cities. Now, and the other one is just property acquisition. So I, I just completed a project and there is a great film called Push. I don't think that was a great title for the film. But the film is extraordinary because the representative for housing right now in front of uh, uh, the United Nations rep for housing has gone to several countries across the world and detected the same types of interventions, which is the acquiring of low-income housing, but we're talking big housing complex, and they're upgrading and then transforming. In other words, you, you tell the, the people who own that house, you can stay here, but you have to pay twice as much. Well, we know what happens then, right? So this is, but these are high financial types who are doing this. This is the other extraordinary thing. And you stand back and you ask, what happened here? Well, it turns out that high finance needs some types of materialities to construct some of its most attractive and desirable instruments. So why not housing? And since what you're talking about is algorithmic mathematics, six complex steps to transform a building into a field of assets, As assets, materialities. And Third type of question, and I complete because I can't go on talking too much here. Uh, third, <laughs> well, it's a horror, actually. So third type of question, who is actually, you know, who is behind this? What is happening? What else can be done? And, and there you really enter into... A, world, a, a few, actually, a limited number of very major actors who are going across, you know, quite a few different countries, etc., and who can further elaborate those instruments. 
And what it really means is that there is right now in the high financial sector a demand for assets. We have sort of run out of assets. An asset has some element of materiality in it. So housing becomes the object. And I, I urge you to see the film Push, where the rapporteur, as I said, for the United Nations, has gone to several countries and talked with people and asked. It's a very sort of modest film, right? But it gives you a sense of this is really an, a global sort of effect, if you want, or a global project of going into a whole variety of different countries and working on housing. Now, important is to note that other material elements have already been processed. Housing is still there because we have vast numbers of housing and it doesn't matter that it's very modest housing as long as it can be transformed into an asset and you can do that with housing. So I leave you with this unhappy note, but I, I, at towards the end you also were beginning, beginning to, to bring in the complexities. Now it also means that the leadership of cities and we activists who are interested in protecting, you know, the, the, the city as a common good in a way, right? Uh, that there is really work to be done. And I must say, when I look at how, what kinds of economics is taught in many of, in most of our universities, it's mostly microeconomics. And that is not necessarily going to help us. There are other modes of economics that will. But microeconomics sort of does not necessarily get into that issue. So this is another call, since we are in a university, to really expand. Uh, our university happens to be a very good one on this, so I'm not criticizing, God forbid. Uh, <laughs> God, do you forbid? I'm not so sure, but anyhow. Yeah. So, so we really need to add elements of knowledge that go beyond the familiar microeconomics. If we have young students who want to learn, they should learn about types of instruments that are based on algorithmic mathematics that are really quite different from traditional economics. Because that is also in play, uh, and cities have become these, these places where the, the objects are there. So, you know, we are, we are really transforming a whole variety of of sort of material elements that we think of as a building, a house, into something else, a very abstract instrument that can be bought, sold, bought, sold, bought, sold, you know, across a whole variety of different countries and, you know, different buyers, different sellers. On that very happy note, yeah. Yes, so I think these are very <laughs> serious questions and also maybe challenges to the idea of local citizenship and an imagined community, uh, how much can we uh, mobilize against these kinds of challenges? Well, I think that's very, um, uh, that's difficult. And it's, and it's um, uh, for instance, in Amsterdam, we see um, um, uh, buildings, housing, uh, getting into the hands of just a few very rich speculators, um, from making it different countries also. Also, but uh, in no in Holland, also from the royal family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, which is which is not a secret. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, and um, I think it, it it demands national regulation because it is very difficult to. Um, uh, um, um, yeah, sometimes you have to help to intervene on a local level. Um, we cannot do it without the help of the national government, and also in Europe, uh, very often with the uh, uh, with the help of the European government. So uh, yes, our, our 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 means are are not very. We we cannot do very much. No, it, it, it is very difficult, actually. Yeah. It really is. And so just as a little footnote, something that is another type of difficulty, but it hangs in the same subject. So the, the, um, the Qatari royals, nothing against them, by the way, now own more of central London than the Queen of England. I think that happens to be sort of cute almost, right? <laughs> but, but, but still, you say, 
still, you know, there is a fluidity which has many positives, but at the same time, we know what's next. So one way of thinking about it is we have entered a new era. Which well, is well you know, and, and in Amsterdam, we are still, I think we, are, we still have time, but we are in a hurry. Um, you know, when you go to London, um, um, it is impossible to find a house in the city. Um, uh, only, um, and in Amsterdam, you can still find a house, but it is very difficult. And if we continue, then our city will not have houses for nurses teachers, police officers, and if that happens, then our city also stops being the place that is made up of these um, uh, people, and that's really going to be a problem. Is there is there any hope uh, in uh, the historical example of the social housing corporations that yes. historically were, I think, a, a very important yeah. organizational foundation of, of that civic pride, eh? that, yeah. uh, being yeah. a member of such a corporation, yeah. living in such a, a home, yeah. was a very important element of, of civic pride. Is that is that something that we can um, um, reconstruct in any way? You ask me? Yes. I have only been looking at the negatives. <laughs> so it well. was great to hear you. <laughs> the, the first, like, you know, quite a good bit. It was all sort of the good stuff, you know. But, but really, uh, yeah, I should do my homework a bit on the good things, too. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But maybe well, I, I'd say I say in Holland there is a very strong tradition in public housing, and um, in Holland, of in in Amsterdam, there's um, the the it is particularly strong, and um, there there are. Um, very beautiful projects. Uh, there have been very b beautiful projects in the 20th uh, century, and we can repeat them because we are affluent. And um, I think we have a, a, a city council at the moment and a city governance who also have the ambition to um, create houses also for um, uh, um, for, for the poorer uh, people. I mean, you know, I want to tell something. You probably know about this, but I've spoken with some Dutch who don't know this. It's a bit a different subject, but it is an indicator of something. And that is that the retirement funds in Germany and the Netherlands and a few other countries have actually gone from 3% to 6% taking out. The Dutch, a group of Dutch, do you know about this story? Dutch economists figured out that this was an abuse, and they actually succeeded. They succeeded with the Dutch uh, 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 retirement funds to eliminate that other 3%, so that the, so it's not 6%, it's 3% only that the retirement people have to leave, you know, in the, the which they cannot take out. Was that clear or not? That was a bit messy. But I, no, but I mentioned this because I was impressed how the Dutch were the ones who actually figured it out. Well, I don't know enough. I don't know enough about the subject yeah. Yeah, to yeah, say yeah. something about yeah, it. Yeah. But there are probably Dutch well, people here who know something who about know the a lot of, of the pension funds. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah so but Nina. I, I, but I guess it's <laughs> one one element. <laughs> <laughs> One element, I guess. She found uh, her victim. <laughs> yes, I <Yeah>. found <laughs> Now we're going to check it out, yeah. right? But well, may I say something else? Yeah, we do have a problem of housing, but it's not the only problem. It's also uh, the disappearance of public space. You know, there's scarcity in uh, in in our cities, in in grounds, in in. Um, um, and as as the prices for uh, you, you don't say ground for uh, for land as the prices for land rise, um, nobody wants to invest in sporting facilities or parks or um, uh, other places domain. or uh, yeah that are that are, are, are um, historically part of the public domain and are also the the places where people meet each other and I think that is something that every local government really has to invest in because if that disappears in your city then also your local community uh, threatens to disappear but that that's that's one of the few things I would say that you can decide at the local level Level in, yeah, because yes. it's your it's your tax base, yes. and Amsterdam actually has decided to raise that yes. amount because then you can pay all those wonderful things for the city. That's true. So how to balance that problem? Yeah, because you need the money. 
Well, we are very affluent at the moment, yeah. so there is some money. But and 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 you have to make a choice where and how to invest. But for instance, in the, uh, our local government, there is a discussion now: is we need to build a lot of houses, uh, also for expats, because as a result of Brexit, for instance, um, Amsterdam is getting a lot of uh, expats, and it's. It's good news. It's, it's very good for our local economy. But if we are building houses and we do not invest at the same time in new public space, then our new neighborhoods are not going to be of the same quality that the older neighborhoods are. So we have to decide if we want to build, if we do not invest in the same time in, for instance, uh, new sporting facilities, parks, etc. There, there was. Let me, let me just uh, one round of the conversation, and then we can go to the audience. There was an, an, another element in your talk um, re related to uh, radicalization, yes. uh, perhaps also in in combination with the issue of diversity and how diverse can a city actually be. Yeah. Now, Saskia Sasa has written about expulsions, and I think there is maybe a connection here in the sense that um, uh, new cities tend to expel and to drive away people who are unwanted, who are obnoxious, who are maybe also dangerous or seen as dangerous. It is a, 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 a phenomenon that you see generally, I would say, in cities, that you, they, there, there's a, an element of social control there as well. So, I mean, But that is one of the issues, the fact that a city is <coughs> inevitably marked by inequalities, by competitions, by et cetera, et cetera. And the admirable thing about cities is that they have handled that yeah. across centuries yeah, and that often good things have come out of it and of course bad. I mean, there is no perfect city. Yeah? It never, and so what is it about the city, which is an open system basically, it's not a closed system. What are the multiplicity of complexities and diversities that come together that create the possibility of, of of the survival, you know. And when you think about it, look how many formal systems of power, far more powerful than any city, have uh, are done, are finished. And cities across the centuries, different epochs, yeah. different, you know, whole different economies, there they are. So, and I think that it is the, the diversity, the complexity, and the openness of a city. And that is something that when we look at some of these efforts, say, of creating, no, you know, new cities, that they will be simple. That's not a city, you know, if, if you have a sort of just a big housing complex and then and the shops. And the admirable thing about a city is also its, its inequalities. You know, you, you have low earning workers in all cities and you have very high earning. And so what is it about the city? What is its DNA that, that enables it to do that? And it, at the same time, it functions so differently from a country. The country is always more engaged by military issues and competitions with other uh, uh, countries, etc. But the city is quite an admirable thing. And so when I see some of these new kinds of cities, which are basically housing complexes and a few shops, that's not a city. But the, the, in, in, in the Netherlands, you don't uh, then have that, right? Well, you know, I, I think that um, the reason um, cities have always handled um, polarization uh, for instance, is because the other, the other person, is your neighbor. Um, that's also exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what makes it very different from um, uh, more rural areas, where people who are different from you live far away. So in a city, uh, people live nearby. Um, so that makes uh, the city population very pragmatic. Um, because you have to live with each other. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons uh, you need public space, because those are the places where you meet each other. And I think what threatens the city, that is segregation. Um, and, and the disappearance of public space. Uh, because if that happens, then one of the elements of city life, you meet each other, and the other is always nearby, is also uh, disappearing. But I, th I guess also, and one of the issues that you wanted to address, I think, in the, in the notion of radicalization, it's not always fun 
to no, meet the no. other. And sometimes the other makes a claim to public space that yes. might be seen as problematic by other others. So yeah, how, that's true. How, is the, do you see any responsibility there for a city government to manage that? Well, I'd say that the, that the most important responsibility of, govern, uh, of, of a local government is to keep the peace and uh, is to create procedure to create space again, an environment where people can uh, differ. And it is not by saying you shouldn't be here or you cannot be here. Um, I was just in, offer, in office and I brought myself in a very uh, tangible position because we had a law, uh, we have a law coming on and it's called the Burka Verbot. Yeah, um, and its national government wants to prohibit um, uh, women wearing um, the niqab or the burqa. And of course, in Amsterdam, we will uphold the law if it, uh, uh, yes, of course, because I'm not going to bring myself again in a, in a horrible Asma position. Will uphold the law. I will not do, uh, say that again. But um, I think for local government, it's very important to keep the peace. And that also means that even if you really dislike the niqab, which is the case in my, for me, then I still have to protect the women wearing it. Um, because uh, as part of the city, it is that there are very different people uh, living in a, in, a, in a small space. And the only way when, uh, the, 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 to, to live together is that you have a government who says everybody has a right to be here, as long as, it, as, it, as you're peaceful. And that is <coughs> actually a very important point that those without power, those who are poor, yeah. <coughs> they can stand up and make claims. You know? And that the city is one of the few places where they can do that yeah. because at the national level it's more difficult. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a couple of questions. I had a, had a question here in the back there. So let's uh, take a couple and then we see where we get. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if the, if the Maybe a mic? Yeah, you get a mic. I would, I would like to know if um, we are talking about housing, about uh, keeping our public spaces and about uh, how connecting by telling stories or sharing stories. Yeah. How about a, a whole total new concept of uh, housing where you have in the housing complex community places where you can share stories? Yeah. What's your comment on that? Maybe we take a couple of questions. So I had a question in the back there, and there, and uh, Margaret. Typically in New York City, when you see a new business opening, it's a restaurant, and they have a 90% failure rate here in New York City. Do you see the same thing going on in Amsterdam, in the city of Amsterdam? That's a good question. <laughs> you mean the high failure rates? <laughs> yes, I think it's the same. There's a question, yeah. There's a question there. Hi, thank you. I'm a student here, well, and it's. Yeah, yeah, but oh, we, we take sorry. a couple yeah, questions. Right. Then we yeah, we um, I'm a student here, so it's really an honor to hear you all speak. And I had a question because um, I'm part of the European Society here, and we've often talked, actually, in our weekly discussion sessions about things about topics like how to deal, how to connect the more local aspect of city, the more local dimension of cities with the federal dimension of the EU as a union. And so I was wondering if you could comment on how you think we could strengthen sort of a partnership between cities and the European Union, because that seems to be a more efficient pathway, at least at the moment, than at the national level of the EU. Thank you. OK, so f f for this round, you, you want to wait? So let's, uh, let's first see um, these three issues of the uh, very local communities, the shops, and the highest level, at least in Europe.
Well, um, first, in answer to um, uh, the lady here in front, um, I think you're right. I think you should experiment with new forms of, uh, of uh, making it possible for people to live differently than only in a in a in a nuclear family in the city. Um, so I think that um, uh, our housing projects should make it possible. For instance, also uh, making it possible that pe people of different ages live together because. I think one of the uh, dramas in modern cities is that uh, the elderly and the young people aren't living together. And I think for our survival, it's very important that there is some contact. Uh, so that's like answer to yours. And then, um, well, you know, there is no formal um, um, position for local governments in the EU, which does not mean that you could play a role. And I think it is important to play a role because what we see in the European government is that the national states are becoming so polarized and uh, uh, there's so much, um, there are so many fights and they are so um, afraid to take a stand on many issues because of the national electorate. And I think uh, local governors do not have the same fear and are more pragmatic. So maybe, um, uh, I, I know there are some initiatives for um, uh, European mayors to come together and elder men to uh, form European um, meetings. And I think that's very wise to do. Can I ask Question. Yeah. <laughs> this is for you. So, so here, the, here you are in New York. Nobody will tell anything to the people in Amsterdam. Uh, I, th I thought the same with the burqa for bots. <laughs> I thought I, I, I told course, right. just a couple of people somewhere. Right. So, what's the toughest part of of being a mayor? What is it that has surprised you? After, oops. Well, that's okay. That has surprised you. Uh, you know, that you didn't expect, given your past experience, et cetera, your past life, about a city. What, what is it that really bothers you? For instance, for me, in, what bothers me in New York is that all the corporates are buying up far too much housing. That's just very simple and plain, but it is really something that I consider extremely serious and negative, right? What is it for you? And it's difficult to control, right? It's difficult to, to change. Well, I, I think, um, well, let me first say, it is really great being a mayor. It's by far, I yeah, it's by far the nicest yeah. thing I have ever done. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I'm the most privileged person on earth, I, I think. Um, so. Um, that, that's great to hear, by the way. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, but then um, I, I think um, I think the crime in the city. When you're just an inhabitant, you do not know how much crime there's going around and how much criminal money, and that is really a problem. Money, that's yeah, different it's, from. No, it's 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 money. We have a very vivid uh, drug economy, and um, there is so much money involved. And it's really um, eroding our city, and that's that's really a problem. And we also we are really looking for ways to uh, to, to make it less. But to, well, that's very difficult. It's, it's perhaps also a, a particularly Dutch problem. Uh, the, the, I think the Dutch are the largest producer of synthetic drugs in the world, uh, and also. Import really and so? We're number one. Well, but uh, uh, synthetic drugs is not our problem, and it's more in the south of Holland. Now we are, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the south of Holland. Or so, on Belgium. well, <laughs> it's, we always say it's below the river, so uh, <laughs> it doesn't come to the other side. But now it's uh, cocaine. Okay. And and it's it's um, we are we are um, uh, we, we are in Amsterdam uh, we are big in international cocaine trade especially for the American market so you should thank us. <laughs> I know I know there are probably oh, what, what are you <laughs> there's there's a question there huh? Did the United States get it from Mexico directly? Yeah. 
no, 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 no. Oh, we're going okay. to have this discussion later, but you so, are wrong and I am right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question uh, in the back. Uh, maybe another one further in the back. Um, uh, you still want to ask your question, Margaret? Good. Yes, Hi. please. Um, Let's take three other questions. I have a relevant, it's a little off topic, but it's still relevant, I promise. Um, I'm curious how, how many refugees have been accepted into Holland and specifically Amsterdam, um, and then also how that has impacted housing in Amsterdam. Um, since I know that you mentioned, uh, you know, you're trying to find housing and, and deal with that with people coming from the UK, so I'm sure if there have been a significant number of refugees accepted in, in Amsterdam, there's probably a similar issue, I would imagine. Let's take another question and a third question there. Yep, good. Hi, um, I'm Margaret Crosby Arnold. I'm here at Columbia. I'm a historian, and I've worked for the last uh, years to um, build the uh, history of diversity in Europe. And I want to say that your talk was really quite refreshing. Um, and also, I think you said something that is of critical importance. And I certainly appreciate these financial issues, but I refer to those sometimes as the sort of 30,000 feet issues. Um, there are other issues then are, that are more on the ground, I think. Um, and I think talking about diversity, and you mentioned something about emotional attachment, um, and that so many feel detached. And that is in large measure, I would argue, because they can't see themselves in the history um, of Europe, whether it is Amsterdam or Paris or any place else. And so I think you know what you said about this in terms of building this history and giving people a sense of belonging Belonging and inclusion is of critical importance. I mean, the reality is, is that, and I would like your perspective on this, that the problem in Europe is precisely a crisis of how to deal with diversity. I mean, that explains Brexit. That explains a lot of what's happening across Europe. That explains the rise of these right-wing movements, um, but also the rise of uh, extremism, local homegrown um, extremism uh, uh, or so. And so I was hoping that you might speak to those issues. Okay. So. Third question in the back. Yes, if you can uh, give the gentleman standing there. Uh. I had actually a very similar question. You were talking about re um, telling our stories. And do you think, as Amsterdam, we're doing a very good job integrating uh, migrants in that story? Because I don't see it personally. Uh, oh. um, you were talking about, um, it was a similar question, actually. You were talking about the. Um, Oh, sorry, you're talking about retelling our stories, yeah. and do you think Amsterdam is doing a good job in that, in, in integrating migrants into our story, the, especially the Muslim community? I don't see how they're getting brought into the story, retelling story of the city of Amsterdam. Okay. You want to respond to any of these? Well, but now I forgot the first question. My, migrants, how many migrants? Oh, uh, how many refugees? Well, um, I think in Holland we accepted a moderate amount of refugees. We always act as if we're a very open country, but that's not true. Um, not in this uh, respect. Um, I think in Holland um, people think that one in four people are uh, refugees, but um, in reality it's one out of 35 or something. So it's quite, or, or even, even less. And um, Amsterdam, um, um, yeah, the, the, the refugees are living there, but um, I don't know the amount. But we do have a, a, a problem with un undocumented um, asylum seekers who are not accepted as refugees, but are still in procedure or are illegal because they're um, and uh, they are they they are a problem because um, we are looking. We know they will not go away. They will not return to their home countries very often because they cannot go to their home countries. Um, so we have to find um, a, 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 a way to let them live in the cities. But in the national opinion, it is very difficult to uh, find a solution because th the discourse is always they are taking our houses. And um, in, in a period when there is scarcity in housing, this is the the debate. Um, so we're 
always compromising, finding um, uh, just well, more or less um, tijdelijke, uh, temporary solutions. And now we are looking for a solution for two or three years, housing them, uh, creating some rest in the, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the political discussions. But still, it is, uh, it's, 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 it's a problem we didn't find a solution for. Um, Stories of diversity. Well, uh, y you are right. Um, in, in Europe, we really have trouble in um, redefining history. And um, there is a growing amount of people coming from afar, uh, from different countries, who demand to be part of our dis uh, history and who ask to rewrite our history. And they are right. But it creates immense political tensions um, because um, I think uh, um, a large amount of our uh, population um, and it is also in uh, fueled by political discussions see it as a loss and not as something that enriches us for instance we have had and i think that's the most um vivid um uh, illustration we've had the discussion on black pete you probably heard about it and i think for every foreigner they really do not understand what is happening here but um, um we have this long tradition of santa claus and and his black helper. And I've gr I grew up with finding it vanzelfsprekend. Um, I'm getting a little bit uh, self evident. Um, and then the discussion arose. And I, like I think, of very uh, uh, many people. Uh, very quickly realized that we had to change and that we had to um, uh, make a new. Uh, festivity to 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 create a new Santa Claus, and in in Amsterdam, uh, the former mayor and its uh, administration really found a good solution. So in Amsterdam, it's not a thing anymore, but it's the only place in the country where it's not a, a thing because we have Black Pete discussion all through the uh, year. It starts in uh, in February and it ends in January. So it's all and. And it's a horrible discussion. And why is it such a horrible discussion? Because um, people think change is losing. And we need politicians, especially on a, on a national level, and this is going to be the most political remark I am going to make. We need politicians on a, on a national level who are going to say and explain that change enriches us. And as long as that is not going to happen, polarization is going to be a big problem in Ireland. And it's going to estrange our migrant population. Maybe a final round of questions, if there is still anyone in the audience. Yes, please. Yeah, two questions. And especially, sorry, I forgot, and especially it's going to harm our Muslim population. Yeah. So I have two questions there. Hi, um, two questions. Sorry for messing up the counting. First is for my brother, who's living in Amsterdam, devout Amsterdam, are very proud of his mayor, but was worried to hear that you're here, actually. Um, so I was wondering, Fair. why are you here and not in Amsterdam? Um, yeah. <laughs> Especially when Ajax is playing against exactly, Juventus, exactly. yes. Um, and it's a risk game. It's, it's a, a game with a high risk. And second question is, you touched about the, on this a little bit, what is the relationship uh, between local identity and national identity and how, how do you see the role of the city government vis-a-vis -vis the national government? Another question there. Just in front. I had a similar question. You mentioned um, uh, new laws, new national laws on the uh, Nikiab and the Burqa, um, and, but that you were still going to enforce those. Now, in America, many mayors have decided to take a stand against what they perceive as being uh, unjust immigration laws by providing uh, sanctuary to uh, undocumented Im immigrants uh, by instructing their uh, employees and police forces to not um, 
work with uh, or collaborate with uh, immigration and customs enforcement. So my question in kind of an abstract sense is at what point, uh, especially in, in your country, does a mayor uh, have a responsibility to uh, resist uh, what she might perceive as being unjust uh, national laws? Well, starting with the last question as being the most simple question. <coughs> um, a mayor can take a stand. Um, question is, do you want to take a stand or do you think it helps? I do not think it helps. Um, in Amsterdam, the, um, uh, the, the local government, I'm not part of the local government uh, or of the political government, um, it has uh, decided to uh, address it as a political issue and not as a humanitarian issue. And um, I think that helps. So our eldermen are discussing it on a, on a national level and, and trying to find solutions. So a mayor is, um, uh, is, I think, responsible to find humanitarian solution. And that's what you're doing if there's no political solution. So I'm waiting for a political solution because I think that's better. Um, that's the first question. And the second, yeah, well, um, I think you have uh, national and local identities at the same time. But what I, I was trying to say in uh, the lecture is um, nationalism is a creation of the 19th century. It was created to, um, to, to make community possible in, um, uh, in a nation state. Uh, um, uh, where, where people were living who would never encounter each other, who would never see each other. Um, and so it was necessary to have some si uh, sense of um, being a group. And if you um, accept that it is a creation, uh, that you not, not completely. It's part of tradition and history, so it changes not rapidly and not with from a dictate from above. So it is. It changes with the stories we tell each other. Um, so national identity can change, as can a local identity. And if if that's uh, if, if you accept that, then you can also recreate or uh, strengthen your local identity. And that's the point I'm trying to make, is I think it's necessary for us to strengthen our local identities, because we really have to give all those new generations of especially bicultural um, uh, young people a sense of belonging. And they need a local identity. Maybe I should um, close this discussion and, uh, and confess that I'm a born and raised Amsterdammer, so I completely dig the story. Um, um, and maybe to add to that, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, the, the words in our, the coat of arms of Amsterdam, heldhaftig, vastberaden en barmhartig. Um, these, um, uh, I, I actually did a study uh, to these, uh, to why, where, what happened with these words, and actually these words were the foundation of the idea of Amsterdam as a lastige stad, a difficult city, and there was something positive. It was positive to be difficult, wow. and I think that is something that people in Amsterdam can share and can recognize in what is happening in New York. New York is also a yes. difficult city, and that's the joy of it. I think um, that you demonstrate it's that uh, idea of uh, it's of it's good to be difficult <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, first of all Femke Halsema for her wonderful talk I want to uh, uh, thank Saskia Sasse for her very um, um, uh, the, the, uh, important interventions I want to thank you for being here and raising all those other difficult questions and uh, I hope to see um, uh, many of you at another occasion either here or in Amsterdam thank you